to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura, and this week's Science Watcher is Dr. Tomoko Tashiro of Aoyama Gakuin University. Hello, I'm glad to be here with you today. Here is today's lineup. Today on The Leading Edge, we have the link between emotions and the sense of smell. And on J Innovators, Michelle? I'll be introducing a Takumi who developed a new material for making extraordinary optical frames. You don't want to miss it. But first, today's Science News Watch. Dr. Tashiro, what caught your attention recently? Located next to Tokyo, Kawasaki City has been working to establish a cutting-edge medical base and has come to an agreement with a company that developed robot suits designed to assist elderly and disabled people in their movements. The city will be experimentally introducing the robot suits to healthcare facilities as a step towards widespread use. The company that Kawasaki City has teamed up with is a venture company located in Tsukuba City, Ibaraki Prefecture. The robot suits will enable elderly and disabled people to stand, walk, and perform other movements. It's expected to bring a major change to the healthcare and medical industry. People who can't walk on their own will be able to get around with the robot suit's assistance. Regular use of the robot suit is expected to have a rehabilitative effect as well. The city plans to borrow the robot suits from the company, introduce them to local care and medical facilities, and assess their effectiveness and safety. The president of the venture company commented, by having the robot suits used throughout the whole region, we'll be able to find new ways to improve its functionality before we make it available to the whole world. Having the robot suits to assist with movement will significantly improve the quality of life for the elderly with decreased muscle strength. It will be interesting to see how robot suits become a part of our lives. It's something you'd see in a sci-fi movie, but it's become a reality. It's quite amazing. And now for the leading edge. Today we have the sense of smell, which has the power to influence behavior and emotions. Certain smells can make you feel cheerful, while others make you feel depressed or nostalgic. Dr. Tashiro, has this ever happened to you? Yes. Whenever I cut open and smell a watermelon, it takes me back to my childhood days. In summer, my younger brother and I would often sit with our feet hanging over the edge of the porch and eat watermelons together. So whenever I smell a watermelon, the memory comes vividly to me. You're right. A certain smell can bring back memories. And is it true that advances in neuroscience are uncovering what happens in the brain when a smell is detected? Yes. And in addition, scientists have also found a surprising link between the sense of smell and brain diseases and are working to clarify its mechanism. There is also an ongoing study on the use of aromas to prevent diseases. Let's find out more about our amazing sense of smell. In 2007, the image of a mouse standing fearlessly next to a cat made news around the world. What gave the mouse its courage? This mouse was created by Japanese scientist Ko Kobayakawa of Osaka Bioscience Institute. Kobayakawa has been using mice to learn about the mechanism behind the sense of smell. Smell is a vital source of information for mice. When a paper with a food scent is placed near a mouse, it sniffs the air for a bit, then moves towards the scented paper. Mice are nocturnal and move around in the dark. They use their sense of smell to locate food, detect danger, and gather information about their surroundings.
Next, the mouse was given a certain scent. After sniffing the air, the mouse turned its head away. Its reaction is completely different from how it reacted to the food scent. It then retreated to a corner of the case and remained completely still. This is because the paper had the scent of a fox, which is a natural enemy. But this mouse has never encountered a fox before. It never met its natural enemy, but it doesn't need prior experience to know that it's dangerous and feel an instinctive fear. That's why it acted the way it did. This is a mouse's smell sensing mechanism. In the back of its nose are smell sensors that catch odor molecules. When the odor molecules land, a signal is sent to a part of the brain called the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb's reaction pattern changes according to the odor. The brain deciphers the pattern and registers what the odor is. The olfactory bulb has two sections. One part is connected to innate responses and another to learned responses. When the part connected to innate responses was stimulated, it caused the mouse to exhibit instinctive behavior, in this case, to freeze in its tracks. This particular mouse has been genetically engineered and lacks the innate section of the olfactory bulb. When presented with a fox's scent, the mouse is unruffled and continues to move around normally. Eventually, it walks over the scented paper. The smell of its natural enemy doesn't seem to bother it a bit. The reason the mouse shown in the photo earlier wasn't afraid of the cat was because it lacked the part of the olfactory bulb that's connected to innate responses. We witnessed a complete change in its behavior, and this confirmed our theory. And it finally led us to the scientific mechanism behind it. By continuing these studies, I'm hoping that it will provide us with clues about what kind of actions we take or what kind of emotions we feel when we smell something. I didn't know that mice were born with smells that they dislike. The knowledge of dangerous smells is genetically passed on. It's similar to how humans dislike rotten smells. This reaction is believed to stem from the instinctive knowledge that rotten food is dangerous. Another study reveals how the sense of smell is closely connected to memory. Let's take a look. Dr. Mitsuo Tonoike collaborated with Tokyo Denki University on a study of the brain's activity when an odor is detected. A mask was placed over the test subject's nose, and he was given different odors to smell. They used a functional magnetic resonance imaging device, also known as an fMRI, for their study. This is a side view of the head. The right side of the screen is the front of the head. The part in the circle caught Tonoike's eye. This part of the brain is called the hippocampus. It's said to be involved in memory. He experimented with other smells and found that the hippocampus reacted each time. A large-scale study on the sense of smell was held at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at Rush University, Chicago, USA. 589 people participated in the study, which was to determine the connection between the sense of smell and cognitive impairment.
All the test subjects were healthy individuals between the age of 54 and 100. Papers like this were used in a test. When the sticker was scraped, it released an odor. The test subjects were asked to identify what the smell was. The sheet listed four possible answers. The options were smells that most Americans are familiar with, such as grass, pizza, motor oil, and pineapple. Tell me what you smell. One, grass, two, pizza, three, motor oil, four, pineapple. Grass. Grass, one, grass. There were 12 questions in total. While some people answered easily, I don't know. Some people could not identify what should have been familiar smells to them. The study went on for five years. The results showed that compared to the people who got 11 out of 12 answers right, the people who only got eight answers right had a 1.5 times higher risk of developing mild cognitive impairment, which is a precursor to Alzheimer's disease. So a deteriorating sense of smell could be a sign of a disease. Yes, we are learning that an impaired sense of smell may be an early symptom of Alzheimer's disease. But couldn't it also be caused by old age? Perhaps. What's interesting is that young people with Alzheimer's disease also had olfactory problems before developing the disease. Could you tell us more about it? Of course. First, let me explain the mechanism behind our sense of smell. When you smell something, it's first communicated to the olfactory bulb. Then it goes to the entorhinal cortex, which relays the information to the hippocampus. When a person develops dementia, the olfactory nerves in this area, which are directly connected to the hippocampus, are the first to be affected. The damage then spreads from the entorhinal cortex to the hippocampus and goes on to affect other parts of the brain, causing the condition to worsen. As far as I know, there is still no definite cure for Alzheimer's disease. That's right. However, scientists are studying the connection between the sense of smell and the disease from various angles and are learning many things that may help them develop a cure for Alzheimer's. This next video is about a study on the brain's nerve cells. This is Kageyama Laboratory. It is located within the Institute for Virus Research, Kyoto University. Here they are studying the mechanism of neurons within the brain. This is researcher Itaru Imayoshi. He developed a new technique for coloring neurons within the brain. For many years, it was believed that a fully matured brain could not produce new neurons. But recent studies have shown that new neurons are produced by neural stem cells at two places in the brain. The two places are the olfactory bulb and the hippocampus, which are both involved in the sense of smell. This is a cross-section of an olfactory bulb. Imayoshi gave the newly generated neurons a blue color and observed its development. He found that the blue areas increased over time. A year later, about 70% of the neurons within the olfactory bulb were new cells. It became clear that they were being frequently replaced. This is the hippocampus. The newly born neurons were given a green color. He learned that the neurons produced in the hippocampus settled into the spaces between the old neurons and began increasing. 
However, if new neurons are not produced, then the olfactory bulb becomes hollow. Imayoshi held tests to learn what kind of effect this had on memory. This is how the test works. A round disc with 12 holes is prepared. A basket is placed under one hole. When a mouse is released in the center of the disc, it will immediately begin searching for a hiding place and eventually make its way to the hole with the basket. By repeating the process for a week, a mouse can be trained to remember the hole's location. Once the week is over, the basket will be removed. If the mouse remembers the position of the hole, then it should stay close to it for an extended amount of time. On the left is an ordinary mouse. On the right is a mouse that is incapable of producing new neurons. The ordinary mouse circled the hole where the basket used to be. Meanwhile, the mouse that is incapable of producing new neurons wandered between the different holes. Over the course of three minutes, the ordinary mouse stayed near the former basket hole for an average of 50 seconds, while the disabled mouse stayed for an average of 20 seconds. This shows that the mouse's memory deteriorated when new neurons weren't produced in the areas related to the sense of smell. Because a large amount of neurons are replaced in the olfactory bulb, I believe that they affect the olfactory bulb's various functions, such as uh, emotional control. So, if neuron production comes to a halt, then it could trigger various diseases in the brain. My plan is to study the different possibilities further. That's very interesting. Yes, more is being discovered about the functional significance of the neurons that are produced in the olfactory bulb. The new neurons that are produced in the olfactory bulb are capable of learning smells and are able to rewrite memories easily. The mouse that wasn't able to produce neurons was also seen to abandon its offspring. So the sense of smell seems to be closely related to congenital behavior. It's all closely tied in together. What about the connection between smells and diseases? A lot of people in Japan are talking about Professor Katsuya Urakami of Totori University, Faculty of Medicine. He's using aromatherapy to treat patients with dementia. He held experiments to test the effect that smelling different aromas would have on patients and found that a certain aroma helped to prevent dementia and improve the condition of those suffering from it. Smells and diseases. A lot of people may not see a connection between the two, but it's definitely worth looking into further. We've recently been seeing more studies regarding the integration of brain functions and the mechanism behind it, such as the integration of smell and vision or smell and taste. We may soon learn new things about how the brain handles multisensory integration. Hi, I'm Michelle. Take a look at these glasses. The delicate design is beautiful, don't you think? And it's also very light. But that's not all. Today's Takumi or Innovator created a special frame that retains its shape even when it's bent. Let's go and take a look. This is Sabai City, Fukui Prefecture. The city is known as a major production center for eyeglasses. Of the working population, one out of six people are in the glasses manufacturing industry. I visited an eyeglasses manufacturer. Here they do everything from producing the pots to assembling the pieces.
Hello, I'm Michelle Yamamoto. Hello, I'm Iwahori. Today's Takumi is Kazuo Iwahori. He headed the technical development project that produced these new frames. We went to see what kind of glasses he had developed and its capabilities. That's impressive! Is it really okay to twist and pull it like that? Yes, it's fine. This is a durability test that simulates the off and on movement. 20,000 times is the norm. It's okay, that's amazing! You can also bend it like this, and it's still fine. <laughs> it's incredible! It's bent so much, but it doesn't break at all. The greatest characteristics of these optical frames are its flexibility and its ability to retain its shape. The secret of these revolutionary frames lies in what they're made of. The Takumi had focused on a new material and developed it. But why did an optical frame maker decide to develop a new material? Here's the reason. From the 90s, European companies began entering the market and promoting their high-end brand names. Then, a fierce price competition began with China. The Takumi felt that the only way to beat the competition was to give the products added value. We wanted its functionality to set it apart from our competition. So we placed our focus on the comfort factor. But he wasn't able to make a satisfactory pair with conventional materials. This led him to the decision to develop a completely new material. The goal was to create a super elastic titanium alloy. The Takumi and his team collaborated on a joint research project with Tohoku University's Institute for Materials Research. They evaluated various element combinations and compounding ratios and ultimately created over 200 types. The final product was a combination of titanium, zirconium, niobium and aluminum. The compounding ratio is a company secret. They also avoided using nickel because it can cause metal allergy. This one is made out of the titanium alloy that we developed. This one is pure titanium. Let's try bending them. The pure titanium rod remains bent, but the newly developed super elastic titanium alloy goes back to its original shape. Although he now had a new material, there was another obstacle that needed to be overcome. When we combine the parts with the brazing method that is used for conventional glasses... Whoa! Could you try bending this? Sure. Put more power into it. Really? Are you sure it's all right? Now you can let go. It stays bent. When it is brazed, the area within a 2 millimeter radius is affected by the heat. The heat changed the super elastic titanium alloy's structure and caused it to lose flexibility. A new welding method was needed to keep the elastic quality of the titanium alloy intact. The Takumi set his sights on a new laser welding method that was developed around the same time. I can see a lot of bright sparks, but what's going on here? This is a magnified view. But what's happening here is that a laser beam that's less than a millimeter is shown onto the target area. It melts the metal instantaneously and welds it together. This is a photomicrograph of a laser welded part. As you can see, the welded part is very narrow. The laser welding method keeps the heat from spreading and allows the material to retain its character. The Takumi also developed a tool for securing the pieces to get a more accurate weld and work to enhance the quality. It's been about 10 years since the development project began. Glasses that were created with new cutting-edge techniques were introduced to the world. Okay, so let's...
let's try it on. Mmm, it's very light and very comfortable. It's really easy to wear. We asked him what he focused on the most in developing these glasses. It was to find the best way to combine our techniques and extensive experience to create a product that would please our clients. And at the same time, to find the right elements that would help us remain competitive and come out as a leader in our industry. Here are the glasses. Tomoko, why don't you try banding them? Can I? Sure. Okay. I'm afraid I'm gonna break them, you know, <laughs> but you're right. It's okay. And it goes right back. They're very flexible. So I happen to be wearing a pair of the Takumi's glasses myself. I've owned them for about a year. They are so comfortable that I often forget that I'm wearing glasses. The Takumi's company is using its strength of creating a complete product from scratch to enter a new market, medical care. This is a pair of medical grade tweezers that the Takumi developed. Please try holding them. It's light and easy to hold. And please look at its tip. The tip. It's very hard to see, but the tip is slightly bent. Yes, that's because it turns into a scalpel when it's closed. Hmm. The delicate work is amazing. I think it's a field that they can excel in. Ever since the first titanium alloy glasses were made in Sabai City, the city has become one of a few places in the world with such a high concentration of titanium processing technology. By combining the techniques acquired in the region, they should have enough skill to take on the world. I feel that there is a lot of potential. Thank you very much, Michelle. Dr. Tashiro, how would you wrap up today's program? Today, I rediscovered how mysterious and functional our sense of smell is. I think it brings us more information than we give it credit for. And that's all for Science View. See you next time. <laughs>